we uh, walked Auschwitz. I, I hadn't been there before either. I first of all just wanted to get your thoughts on what it was like to walk Auschwitz and, and Birkenau today. Well, it was incre incredibly uh, moving and, and uh, deeply sad and tragic that humans could do this to other humans. It's good to have the memorial, as, as the plaque says, so that it never happens again. You know, I'd, I mean, I'm a student of history, so I'd seen the pictures, I'd seen the videos, but it's not quite... It's, it hits you much more in the heart when you see it in person. I'm still absorbing, frankly, the magnitude of the tragedy that I witnessed, the uh, place where the tragedy occurred. I think it'll take a few days just to sink in, frankly. Um, as was mentioned, if, if there'd been social media, I think it wouldn't have been impossible to hide. If, if there'd been freedom of speech as well. You know, you know one, of the, one of the first things the Nazis did when they came in is they shut down all the press and any means of conveying information. So it's worth noting in, in the United States, the First Amendment in the United States was freedom of speech because the people that came to the United States from other countries it, w did not have freedom of speech. That if they had said something, they could be imprisoned or killed. And that's why the first correction to the Constitution was the ability to say what you want to say and not be thrown in prison or killed. Yeah, Elon is obviously the, the CEO of X, which is the largest news service on the internet, the place where a huge number of people, including me, get the news. You know, you've been committed since you took over to a much broader perception of free speech on the outlet. And that's led to a lot of criticisms about suggestions of rising anti-Semitism on, on the outlet as well. I can say for my own part that the broadening of speech on Twitter, I think, and on X, has been a, a, an excellent thing. One of the things that, that I was able to do, for example, in the aftermath of October 7th was actually put out full footage and pictures of what exactly was so happening. So see what's really happening. So and, people can, and the true horror is, is, is something people need to be able to see if they want to see it. And the community notes feature has allowed for people to, even when, when things that are false are put up that used to maybe pass in real time, now you can correct all that. How do you balance the necessity for free speech with, with all these critiques about you know, what is hate speech? What is anti-Semitism? And, and how do you balance that? Well, the, the general bias of the platform is to, in favor of free speech. And I think at the end of the day, free speech wins. If somebody says something that's false, especially on our platform, you can then reply to it with the correction. And then I'm a huge fan of community notes. I've put, we've put maximum resources and attention behind community notes. So if somebody tries to push a falsehood, like Holocaust denial or something like that, they can immediately be corrected. And, and, they, and you can't get rid of the tag. It's like stuck on you. <laughs> you, know, you I think it's, and, and the overarching goal for the X platform is to be the best source of truth in the world. Now, now you know, one can, it's, it's difficult to get to perfect truth, and sometimes people have different interpretations of truth, but one can, can always aspire to be as accurate as possible and to minimize the, the error between what is being said. Relentless pursuit of the truth, the goal with, with X, and allowing people to say what they want to say, even if it's controversial, provided, it, provided that it does not break the law. I think that's the right thing to do. And, and setting the new standard for the town square, as I say, has allowed for more speech and more availability of information than ever before, certainly on, on the platform. And you recently didn't just go here, obviously, after October 7th, you went to Israel and you saw the wages of horrific anti-Semitism in the various kibbutzim and I moshavim. Saw, I saw all the videos. I saw a lot of video. Yeah. Yeah. It was shocking to see. I think maybe the most shocking thing was to see the delight in killing innocent people, like the delight in killing kids and defenseless women and men. And there, there was no remorse. Quite the opposite. I mean, uh, that requires a level of indoctrination that is uh, extremely intense. So, so I think that to solve that, you have to address the source of the indoctrination. Because no one should ever be glad about killing some child. I know a number of, an enormous number of Jews, myself included, are very moved that you continue to wear the necklace in remembrance of the hostages. So I have it. So we want to thank you for that, obviously, because raising the profile of the fact there's still dozens of so men, many, women, and so children. Many, I, I checked before I came, so many hostages. I hope they're alive. I hope they come back. So let's talk about you know, the, the uptick in anti-Semitism more broadly. One of the things that's been hard to watch as a Jew, but also just as an American and a Westerner, has been the radical upsurge in anti-Semitic activity, just generally anti-Semitic sentiment, yes. appallingly, after <laughs> October 7th. It's been astonishing, actually. Yes, and I, I, I must admit to being somewhat 
frankly naive about this. In the circles that I move, I see almost no anti-Semitism. Anti and, and you know, there's this old, old joke, I've got like this one Jewish friend. No, I, I have like two thirds of my friends are Jewish. <laughs> I have twice as many Jewish friends as non-Jewish friends. I'm like Jewish by association. I'm aspirationally Jewish. So I don't, you know, was, I was like, what are people talking about with this anti-Semitism? Because I never hear it in, at dinner conversations. It, it's like an absurdity, you know, it, it, at least in my friend circle. But when, you know, looking at the pro-Hamas rallies in vast numbers that took place in almost every major city in the West blew my mind. And on, including on the elite college campuses that are supposed to be, you know, if you're an elite college campus, you're supposed to be enlightened, you're not supposed to be fostering hate. And yet you had these pro-Hamas demonstrations at Harvard, you know, Yale, including at Penn. I went to UPenn at Penn, um, and I was like, this is unbelievable. I mean, there's a poll recently from Harvard Harris showing that some 67% people aged 18 to 24 said that the Jews were an oppressor class, which, you know, in, in America, Jews represent approximately 7 million Jews in the United States out of 330 million Americans, tiny percentage of the population. But that ideology that the Jews are an oppressor class matches up very nicely and very closely with what is a conspiracy theory. At root, anti-Semitism is a conspiracy theory, and it's a conspiracy theory about power. And if you read Nazi literature, the Nazis literally promoted the idea that Jews were, of course, this small caste of people who were running all of the major industries, who were standing behind all world power. As Hitler's suggestion is that it was world Jewry that stood behind behind Germany's loss in World War I, and then the Allies' unwillingness to make a deal with Germany prior to World War II. And you know, that theory of power and group identity is really ugly, and we see echoes of it today. And diversity, equity, and inclusion ideology that basically suggests that all of society is a vast yeah. pyramid of group identity, and that at the very top are the people who are successful, and that those people are exploiting everybody else. And we can tell who's successful by their group identity, not by their level of success, by their group identity. Yeah. It matches up incredibly, it syncs up almost a Venn diagram yeah, circle okay. with anti-Semitism. Absolutely. The diversity and equity inclusion, we should always be wary of any name that sounds like it could come out of a George Orwell book. That's never a good sign. And uh, because it sounds like, sure, diversity, equity, inclusion, these all sound like nice words, but what, what it really means is discrimination on the basis of race, sex, and sexual orientation, and, and it's against merit. And thus, I think, is fundamentally anti-Semitic. Yeah. You know, the, I, I think the, the, the whole, all of the, sort of the, the, all of the riots that were in the major cities and college campuses, I think was a shocking wake-up call to, I think, any sort of civilization or civil-minded person, really. Yeah. It was quite a shock. The crossover between some of these rallies on college campuses in favor of Hamas, I mean, they, they unite the, the weirdest coalitions maybe in human history. You'll yes. see LGBTQ flags in favor of Hamas, where, of course, if an LGBTQ person were to be actually in the I Gaza mean, Strip, they would no longer be in the Gaza Strip. They would be dead. Yes, um, exactly. And that, that coalition like, is... That's, like, seriously out of touch. Yeah, but it, it, it isn't... But it only isn't out of touch in the sense that there is a coalitional idea here yeah. that basically power structures must be torn down at all costs, and if that means allying with people who hate me, then I'll ally with people who hate me. And, and the fact that's grown in fervor since October 7th really is, you know, as I said to me, on, on a personal level, quite shocking. What do you make of the future of a West if, if the West continues to embrace that idea? Well, I think we really need to stop this principle that the weaker, norm, normally weaker party is always right. This is simply not true. If you are in quotes oppressed or the weaker party, it doesn't mean you're right. Because if some of those you know, we, weaker groups want to annihilate you, that does not make them good. We, we just we get, have to get rid of the rule that if you're weaker, you're automatically good. That uh, obviously makes no sense. You know, it, it, you know it, it often makes sense, where it's like, okay, you don't want to beat up on someone smaller and weaker than you, but if that smaller group wants to kill you, that, they're bad, okay? <laughs> I mean, I'm a big believer in moral absolutism, not moral relativism. There is... There's good and bad in the absolute, and you judge any group or individual against absolute moral standards, not whether they're, they're the so-called oppressed or oppressor, just on absolute moral terms. Are they doing good things? Do they want to murder innocent people? That's bad. It doesn't matter who they are. You would think, but the, the pseudo-sophisticates on college campus seem to think differently. And so I, I wanted to get your take on why you think this is so prevalent on college campuses. What do you think the future of the universities in the United States looks like, given the fact that entire universities appear to have been corrupted by moral relativism 
and this sort of perverse ideology. Do you think that a wave of change is coming to the universities? Do you think that there's going to be direct hiring out of high school? What is the solution for universities in the United States as well as abroad? I think we need to return to what it, what, where things were, or mostly were, which is a focus on, and it doesn't matter whether you're a man, woman, you know, what race you are, what beliefs you have, what matters is, you know, how good are you at your job, or what are your skills, you know? You know, you could be a three-legged green Martian, you know, wears a kimono and drinks yak milk, who cares, doesn't matter, you know? It, what matters is, like, how good is your work? That's it. That, that's, the le- that, that's the least sort of racist, sexist you can be, is just care about the work that somebody does and not anything else. That's what the focus needs to be to return to, yeah. Yeah, it seems as though you mentioned earlier the, the sort of problems of tax on the meritocracy. And you know, one, of, one of the claims is that there's no real meritocracy, there's, there's a pseudo-meritocracy, that basically the, all these institutions are run for the benefit of those who run the institutions. And it feels like there is some truth to the idea that institutions have lost credibility with the people, particularly in the West. And in the backlash to that, I think that there's now you know, sort of an idea that if we do away with all institutions and all limits on moral behavior, then that somehow is better. But there needs to be a recapturing of the institutions, or at least a rebuilding in place of those institutions, new things. And that's something, obviously, that you're very focused on, not only with X, but your other companies, is, is building new things, innovation, try and create our way out of the problems that we've created for ourselves. Yeah, I think generally people should always be wary that they may have either consciously or perhaps mostly subconsciously internalized the notion of a, a zero-sum game or a fixed pie. And if you've internalized the, that, that, there's, that, that everything's zero-sum, meaning like in order for me to get ahead, someone else has to not get ahead, or for me to have stuff, someone else must not have stuff. If you have that axiomatic flaw, then that's what, what needs to be done is to, to fix that ac- flaw, because it is false. There's, it's not a zero-sum game. We can absolutely grow, and have grown, and the evidence is overwhelming that we have grown the output of goods and services. We have many things today that we did not have in the past. We are far more prosperous. All of humanity is far more prosperous today than it was at times in the past. I mean, it wasn't that long ago where, you know, we'd, we'd count a good year as one where, well, the bubonic plague wasn't that bad, only killed 10%. You know, we, not that many people starved through the winter. We only lost, you know, 5% of our population due to raids from other tribes. You know, basically life used to be very rough in the old days. And it's, if, if, if they could see us now, they'd be like, what are you guys complaining about? This is amazing. You, you know, not having to worry about food, food for, I mean, we were constrained for you know, probably the last 100,000 years until recently. You know, really the, the present day future is, is amazing compared to the past. And anyone who doesn't think it's amazing is not a good student of history. I think we live in the most interesting of times and probably the best of times. One of the things that I would hope that, and I think you're part of this, is a coalition of meritocrats standing up for the meritocracy is going to be deeply necessary in a future where trust has been fragmented with so many institutions. We're going to have to stand up and loudly say that merit still exists and that merit is individually based, not based on innate characteristics of some sort. You mentioned earlier that that you're aspirationally Jewish, that you surround yourself with, that you're surrounded by so many Jews. Are you part of the Jewish conspiracy? What exactly is the... <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> That'll please the um, haters on, online. Yeah. I'm sure. No, I mean, I just... Yeah, I grew up around a lot of Jewish people. I went to Hebrew preschool, Rachel Spiro in South Africa. I My name is very Jewish. Oh, for, I will tell you that for the past 10 years, people have assumed in my community that you're Jewish until I informed them otherwise. Yeah. Elon yeah. is a pretty Jewish name. He's super Jewish. Yeah. And then I went to Israel when I was 13. You know, I mean, you know visited Masada. I'm certainly checking the boxes on a lot of things. And like I said, most of my friends are Jewish, just worked out that way. Sometimes I, yeah, I guess maybe I forget that. Maybe, am I Jewish? I'm Jewish. Aspirationally Jewish. You know, when you hear critiques about yeah. X, right, about the, the amount of anti-Semitism on X, what, what are the metrics that you're seeing from the inside about the amount of anti-Semitism or quote-unquote hate speech, because it's always a vaguely defined term, sure. hate speech, on your platform? Yeah, I mean, the outside audits that we've had done, at least the ones that we've had done, show that there was the least amount of anti-Semitism on X. If you look at all this, the other social ads, like it's never going to be zero if you've got 600 million people on a platform. Expecting it to be anything to be zero is extremely unlikely because you've got 600 million people on a platform. But when they compare us to you know, Instagram, TikTok's actually got, got a lot of anti-Semitism. TikTok is on. pretty terrifying. If you, if people have not checked out TikTok. I mean, the algorithm yeah. is absolutely pushing you toward pro Hamas material. Yes, it is. I believe it's we, we have. TikTok has like five times the amount of anti-Semitism per post than we do. So it's not, like I said, it's not going to be zero, but 
I, to the best of our knowledge, it is, has the least amount of anti-Semitism of any platform. Legacy media has spent an awful lot of ink on you. There's been a lot of attempts to paint you as anti-Semitic or paint X as anti-Semitic. Where do you think that's coming from? Why does the legacy media seem to have you, particularly in the last year and a half, in the crosshairs so much? Well, I mean, the re reality is that X is competition for the legacy media. You know, X is, a, is where people go to get the most current news and learn about the world. So, like, you know, the legacy media is our direct competitors. So they're really going to find try to, every angle to try to cancel. I mean, the, that's, I mean if you want to know why things are happening, look at the incentives, you know. And legacy media has had uh, a tough time with respect to uh, usage. The numbers I saw was that the sort of traditional print cable television uh, viewership went down something like 20, 30 percent last year. On the other hand, X went up roughly that same roughly 20-30%. So it's a direct competition for people's attention. If there's some attack they can le levy against me, they will. It seems as though one, one of the other matters is not just direct competition between the media and X, but also that the, the legacy media for most of my life up until the past you know, 15 years performed what they saw as a gatekeeping function. They were the ones who got to define the narrative. They were the ones who got to determine what was yeah. appropriate news and what was inappropriate news. And then even after social media arose, in the early days, there was this sort of, the sort of things that you articulate were actually articulated by virtually all the social media heads. Mark Zuckerberg used to say the kinds of things that you say. Jack Dorsey used to say the kinds of things that you said. And then there seemed to be an institutional takeover by a lot of legacy media types in terms of the kinds of rules and restrictions that were placed on what you could and could not say on these platforms, who would get banned, who would not get banned. Advertisers weaponized against you know, particular, you know, particular outlets if those outlets didn't follow the diktats that were put forward by, by these types. And it seems like since you took over, one of the biggest objection of all is that they're not performing the gatekeeping function anymore. Someone yes. else is. Well, yes. I mean, I don't think that there should be a gatekeeping function by a small number of, of individuals. I mean, if you, really, if you say, like, for newspapers in America, there are about five editors that decide what what gets put on the front page, or what to focus on, or what not to focus on, and most of the other most of the other papers just copy them essentially. But is that really what we want? Do we want just a handful of people deciding what they think is important? Uh, should it be that the people decide what's important? And I think it should be sort of an organic thing where the people decide what's important and what to focus on, not just a handful of editors. And uh, yeah, they don't like the fact that this power has been taken away from them, but I think it should be. I want to go back to something that you said a little bit earlier, You're talking about the idea that on a more Moral level, you know, the there's nothing that suggests that that simple weakness is itself virtue. That a weak person can be virtuous, but doesn't necessarily mean that they are a powerful person. Yes. Can be, you know, the victimizer, but doesn't necessarily mean that they are. You know, th that logic carried forward, particularly to what's going on in Israel right now, has been, in my opinion, entirely pernicious yeah. and wrong. There's this idea that because Israel is a powerful, militarily sophisticated country that is doing its best to limit civilian casualties in one of the most population-dense areas of the world, in which we have terrorists who are honeycombed throughout every aspect of society, building literally hundreds of miles of tunnels, the entire London subway system worth of tunnels underneath the ground, that somehow you know, Israel targeting those systems and killing a lot of people because when you kill terrorists, unfortunately, and they're embedded among civilians, it's terrible and it's horrifying that every one of those deaths is on the terrorist group that embeds itself with civilians. There's been this logic has been mapped onto that conflict that smaller and weaker means morally virtuous because victimized. Yeah, it really has come completely full circle from or 180 degrees from what has historically been the case. Through most of history, the operating principle has been might makes right. Yeah, for really, up until modern times, might makes right was the, if, if you were stronger, you were right. Now, now we've sort of flipped it to, you know, if you're weaker, you're right. But neither is true. There is rightness independent of strength or weakness. Just because somebody's strong doesn't mean they're right, and doesn't because somebody's weak doesn't mean they're right. You have to look at morals in the absolute. On a broader level, you, you talk a lot about you know, your hope for humanity. I'd say that you're somebody who really loves humanity, which is why you talk about expanding humanity's reach out to the stars. When you go to a place like, like Auschwitz, or when you walk the villages like Kibbutz Berry after October 7th, does that change your opinion of humanity, or does it reinforce what you think humanity can be on both the positive side and on, on the negative side? I think it is actually human nature to love humanity unless you are indoctrinated otherwise. I think the actual default for most people is to love humanity and to love being around. You can take, for example, like what's one of the worst punishments in prison is solitary confinement. And all solitary confinement means is that you're, not, you're 
you, you don't get to hang out with the other prisoners, which might not be the best group of people to hang out with. But even that is considered a terrible punishment to not be able to hang out with other prisoners. So in truth, I think in our nature, we all love humanity unless we are indoctrinated otherwise. And so we have to stop that indoctrination. How do you think that people ought to pursue that? Because obviously we have seen indoctrination at a wide variety of levels, ranging from sort of soft indoctrination in various schools in the West to very hard indoctrination that you see in, for example, the Gaza Strip, where yeah. kids are literally unfortunately, at, at very young ages, they have graduation ceremonies that we've seen tapes of where they're reenacting yes. kidnapping of Israeli soldiers or killing of Israeli soldiers, for example. Th that fundamentally has to be addressed or there will not be peace. The education of kids in Gaza, the, the indoctrination of hate into kids in Gaza has to stop. So, it's, you know, when I was in Israel, I was like, that was my top recommendation, is that you've got to make sure, I understand the need for this to inv invade Gaza, and unfortunately, some innocent people will die. There's no way around it. But the, the, the most important thing is to ensure that afterwards, that the indoctrination, where kids are taught from, as soon as they can understand language, that their goal is to kill Israelis. And if you're told that from when you're a toddler, well, you're going to believe it, and that needs to stop. On a technological side, what do you think can be done there? Because Actually, this is one of the areas where, you know, the Gaza Strip isn't famous for its internet access. You know, there, 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 there are a lot of places around the world where the government puts an extraordinarily heavy hand on the flow of information. You were mentioning that the Nazis, first thing they did was take over the entire press mechanism inside Germany and then inside the occupied areas of Europe. But that obviously happens all over the world right now. And one of the things you've used Starlink for is to try and open up some of those avenues of information. But what can you do? What should yeah, we be aiming at? It's worth noting also that the, the Nazis engaged in, in extreme censorship uh, within Germany for anything that was pro-Semitic. I'm not sure how many people are aware of that, but you were, they, they, they censored any pro-Semitic, anyone who tried to defend the Jews in Germany, any pro-Semitic was, was censored. Yeah. I think freedom of speech and rig rigorous pursuit of the truth is, the way, is, is one way to get a, to defeat hatred. Yeah. When, when I look at the United Maybe States... Maybe the way. Well, when, when I look at the United States, one of the things that, that seems to be breaking down, and, and when any, the first element historically, maybe the last element of a society in a state of mental decline, is a vast outbreak of anti-Semitism. This is what was happening in Nazi Germany, but historically, countries that are in a state of decline tend to have wild outbreaks of anti-Semitism. And it seems to me that one of the key things that can reverse that process is the rebuilding of local institutions. And as local institutions break down, you see sort of this fragmentation of the population. How do you merge the, the need for technological development with the building of those local institutions? families, churches, schools, you know, the kinds of things that societies are built upon. Yeah, actually, I, I should say there, there were really th three things that were my strong recommendation in visiting Israel. One is, obviously, one has to get rid of Hamas fighters who, where reform is impossible. Their only goal is to kill Israelis. They ought to be either killed or imprisoned because otherwise they will simply kill more Israelis. Then the second thing is you've, you've got to change the indoctrination in the schools so that kids are not taught to, to hate from the moment they are two years old. And then the third thing is, and which is a very hard thing to do in this situation, is conspicuous acts of kindness to the people in Gaza. Conspicuous acts of kindness to the people in Gaza. It's just that much harder to hate someone if you do nice things for them, even if they, bite, they try to bite your hand when you do it. Keep doing it. And it, you look at the Marshall Plan after, you know, look at, World, look at the difference between World War I and World War II where after World War I, Germany got an unfair share of the blame. It led to immense bitterness. It's what allowed Hitler to rise to power, was the German soldiers from World War And But then you look in contrast to what happened after World War You had the Marshall Plan. You had, you know, you had the United States coming in and actually uh, funding the rebuilding of Germany and, re and the rebuilding of Japan. How often does that happen in history? But look at the results. No war with Germany. Peace with Japan and Germany for now. Soon it'll be almost a century. So when you look at the state of the West right now, you know, somebody, maybe it's the, all the doom scrolling, but when you, you know, look at the state of the West right now, you're very optimistic, it sounds like. You know, I find it hard to be optimistic in, in this moment. It's been a very ugly couple of years, you know, from Ukraine to the current conflict in Israel and Hamas to domestic politics in the United States and where else. It seems like there's a lot of polarization, a lot of fragmentation. What do you think is the future of, of the West? Can we come together? around any sense of shared common values, especially given the fact that everybody is kind of drinking from the fire hose of information. One of the downsides about, the upside of information is the availability. The downside is, you know, choice paralysis and overload. <laughs> 
mean, you can definitely get information overload. There's so much information coming at you these days because you can get all the world's information in real time, and it's impossible for a hu one human to digest all that. You know, I think there are some things that we can agree on, or most people would agree on, are cool and inspiring, like humanity going to the moon. You know, if you ask probably kids almost anywhere in the world, what's the coolest thing humans have ever done? I think a lot of kids would say, we went to the moon, you know? And so I think we want to continue that spirit of exploration. You know, speaking of kind of growing the pie, and is that we, we want to, I think, have a dream that we can be a space-faring civilization, a multi-planet species, a multi-stellar species, and go out there among the stars and discover the nature of the universe, that we can collectively seek greater enlightenment to better understand this incredible universe we live in. I find that very compelling. I think most people would find that very compelling. I think embedded in that is also, as you say, that core value of meritocracy. Because it's one thing to say man can go to the moon. It's another thing to say I can be part of man going to the moon. And a meritocracy suggests that you can be part of that. It's not just that human beings are capable of doing the thing. It's that you can be a part of that thing if you work hard enough, if you innovate enough, yes. if you try hard enough. And so societies that seem to have given up on that also seem to have given up on, on going to the moon. Societies that are so reflective about their own supposed flaws, the United States has this problem right now, that they are unwilling to, to simply say freedom is pretty phenomenal and meritocracy is the greatest thing that's ever been invented and we should hold on to that and that's what's going to allow us to get to the moon. That, that stops us from going to the moon or to Mars or to anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, th th there's, and there's many wonderful, interesting things that are happening besides space exploration. Obviously, as time goes by, we improve our ability to cure cancer, to cure many diseases. There's uh, increased access to information and people talk a lot about inequality, but what about the equality of access to information? That's incredible. You know, right now, if you've got you know, a very cheap electronic device at an internet cafe, you can access all of the lectures of MIT for free. You can access almost any book. You can learn anything. This is an equality of access to information that was unthinkable even 20, 30 years ago. You can teach yourself how to do anything for free. That's amazing. Maybe there's like too much focus on the things that are unequal, but we, should, we forget about the things that are equal and that have, have improved inequality so much, like access to information. You know, that's one of the things that we're trying to help out with Starlink is provide access, internet, internet access to people who don't have internet access or where it it's too expensive for them to afford. Because once you have internet access, you can learn anything and you can sell your, your, your products and services. I think that's, that's pretty amazing. I mean, you know, that if, if, if we're going to count our flaws, we should also count our blessings. One of the things that I think is amazing about what you've been doing, Elon, is that it's not just, you know, the business side of you that's important, obviously. You've become this unbelievably you know, large figure looming in the public imagination, and that means that when you tweet, it has you know impact that is very large. How do you decide when to tweet? Sometimes it's memories, sometimes it's joking, sometimes it's these long thought out posts. How do you decide when to tweet? How do you inform yourself on the topics that you're tweeting about? Well, I do put post a lot on the X platform. You know, sometimes a hundred times a day. And once in a while, I'll do something dumb for sure. But really, you know, I try to say things that I think are interesting or funny. I mean, there must be some reason why 169 million people follow me. I guess. I don't know. I must be keeping them amused in some way. So amuse, entertain, you know, have opinions on something. Sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they're right. And, you know, and for things like community notes, it applies to me as well as it applies to anyone else. If I say something that's incorrect or, you know, not full context, then community notes will correct me very quickly. But it's only me doing these posts ever. I don't have a team or anything. In fact, I generally would recommend for leaders of the world to just literally post your own stuff. And once in a while you make a mistake, don't worry about it. Yeah. Can't um, win them all. Can't, nobody bets a thousand. Obviously, where we visited today, you know, the big takeaway always is never again. You know, the, I think that the question that a lot of Jews worldwide asked after October 7th and after that wild upsurge of anti-Semitism, which we've seen, the Jew hatred that, that continues now, is whether never again really for a lot of people meant never again between the years 1939 and 1945, or whether it actually means never again like right now, as in if there is a genocidal group that wishes to kill lots of Jews, is that something that you wish to stand up against right now? And when you look out at the world, in the state of the world, you know, the, the video that EJ put up a moment ago suggesting that the Holocaust would have been somewhat mitigated or people may have had more information, oh, yeah. been able to, yeah. certainly been able to escape earlier. I mean, one, one, of, the, yeah. one of the things that's astonishing, obviously, Absolutely. about the history of the Holocaust is how many Jews, because they were only getting part 
personal information. It was slow and it was gradual, and by the time they wanted to get out, it was just too late for them to get out. You know, wh what are your hopes that never again is a real thing? I mean, I certainly hope there's not yeah. the Holocaust. How sure. realistically is it? I it, think it's unlikely, frankly. Or at least if you say, like, I mean, I could be naive, but I think the probability of a Holocaust in the West is extremely tiny. You know, I think if you look at, say, the, you know, the Nazis, I think Hitler got like a third of the vote or something like that when he was f first semi, he was sort of, sort of semi-elected and then did, did basically a coup. And, but, but think of all the people that fought to destroy Nazis, the millions and millions of people that fought and, and who died to destroy Nazism. The, that's the vast majority of the West opposed, even in those days, opposed Nazi and fought and died. And my grandfather was uh, in World War II for almost six years. All his friends got killed. He was the only one of his friends to survive. And he was severely traumatized. Like, he really just couldn't even talk afterwards. Most of that time was in East Africa, North Africa, Italy. The only reason he's even alive, frankly, is because towards the end of the war, they gave, like, a, an aptitude test. Because he was just a corporal. He, he didn't graduate high school, so he wasn't eligible for officer school. And they plucked him out probably right before he died and sent him to work for British intelligence in London, which is where he met my grandmother. You know, so he was one of the people fighting to stop the Nazis, and many, along with millions of others, you know. So let's not forget that the vast majority of the, of the West fought and died to stop Nazism. I had the chance to briefly meet your three-year-old today. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's, a, he's a fun guy. A, adorable. I have a three-year-old of my own, so I can, they're all very similar. In, but, you know, as you're, you have some kids who are much older, you have, you know, kids who are, who are younger, obviously. But when it comes to teaching them about things like the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, how do you address those topics? Well, my kids are pretty well-read, so they read a lot of history. They're not ignorant on the subject. I mean, maybe the three-year-old is, sure. Uh, <laughs> I would just, hope, yeah. can't read. No, my, my kids are very well-read. But I, you know, they have, I've had some sort of d disturbing conversations with sort of some, say, nephews or some family members, not my kids, but kids of family members where I was actually shocked to see anti-Semitism, or, or at least, yeah, one disturbing conversation was, you know, saying that the, you know, that we deserve to have the trade towers destroyed because of our terrible foreign policy. I was like, this is what they're teaching you in elite New York high schools? This is messed up. Well, Elon, I think I personally, Jews all over the world, a lot of people in this room want to thank you for not only visiting Auschwitz, but also visiting Israel after October 7th and for the strong moral voice you've been on behalf of the fight against anti-Semitism. It's great to spend time with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Elon. Thank you, Ben, for very interesting interviews. interview. Thank you for the questions and thank you for the answers. I would like now, please, to call the 10th president of the State of Israel, Ruven Rivlin, and Dr. Joel Mergui, the president of the Consistoire of Paris, for a, for a brief picture, please. Thanks, President Israel. Dr. Jean Bergui, the President of the Council of France, will take please a picture before we move on with the program. Thank you. President, in, in, President Rivlin, if we please could call you uh, for the. Okay. okay. House, we hold it again? It's quite heavy. Okay. Yeah, please do. Okay.